All right, let's see here. Okay, so Lightroom resources. We're talking about Lightroom today, and um, these are some books on my shelf. Now, I don't read these books cover to cover, but I usually purchase them and have them as references. Uh, so if you're going to have any kind of uh, resources of Lightroom on your shelf, I would recommend these three minimum. Uh, Scott Kelby's book, Lightroom CC uh, for Digital Photographers, and then Victoria's uh, Frequently Asked Questions, The Missing FAQ. She does a phenomenal job, and uh, she's out of Britain, out of the UK. I would highly recommend, and, um, and then... Uh, how do, how do I do that in Lightroom? It's a new book uh, by Scott Kelby. And it's a thin book, but it basically, it's built a, around questions. You know, how do you do this? How do I import it, photos, etc. For some people, it might be very basic, but it has a lot of really cool things in it. So I would recommend it. And all these books are available on Amazon or Victoria's website or Kelby's website. So it's not difficult. Uh, there are, there are other resources out there too, of course. Um, just, just go into Amazon search Lightroom CC uh, and you'll come up with some other stuff. But uh, these are the three that I would, that I would recommend uh, to get, to get started or just like I say, just to have around or they might be good reading bedtime reading. All right, let's talk about image monitor, image and monitor resolution. This is something that, that I've been playing with and thinking about for a long time. You've got to know, because, you know, when we take our pictures, right, and uh, in our cameras, and I get two examples here, the 5D Mark III, I'm a Canon guy, in case you didn't know, and the 7D Mark II, uh, the image resolutions on those two different files are as follows. Uh, the 5D Mark III is an image resolution of 57, 5,760 5, pixels by 3840. And then the 7D Mark II is 5472 by 3648. So if you, if you notice, the resolution is almost, uh, for the 7D Mark II, is almost as good as the full frame, but not, not quite. Just a little less resolution. But these cameras are getting so good nowadays. The point is that this is the size of your file. And then the other point is, what are you post-processing it on? In other words, uh, are you using a laptop? Are you using a desktop? And um, what's the resolution of your screen? So the point is, is if your file is, uh, is like a, the 5D Mark III, if it's 5760 by 3840, and you're editing it on a monitor that's half the resolution, you're not getting the full benefit uh, if you will, of, of that file. In other words, uh, you're, you're, you're editing your files at a lower resolution than your, than your file itself. So you may, uh, you know, if you're interested in fine detail and prints that you're going to make and what have you for videographers and, and photographers, you know, the, your, your resolution of your screen is kind of important. If you don't know the resolution of your screen, uh, you can always check it out on, uh, on a Mac. It's very easy. Go under, uh, about this Mac and, and you can easily see your resolution. But if you have a PC, I, I'll be honest with you, I, it's been years since I've used a PC, so uh, you, you have to figure that out yourself. But here's my example. I for, for the last few years, I've been using my MacBook Pro 15 Retina screen uh, for editing my images. Um, but I had it hooked up to an Apple 27-inch uh, Thunderbolt display. So, okay, so my image is 5760 by 3840, for example. Then I'm editing it, editing it on a MacBook Pro, and the resolution there is 2880 by 1800. So, obviously, more or less half the resolution, right? And then I was using an Apple Thunderbolt display, which resolution is 2560 by 1440. So, I was actually editing my photos on, in, in the end, because uh, I didn't like editing on the laptop because the screen's not big enough, blah, blah, blah. So I do it if I have to. But basically what I was doing, I was, I was going from having a file that was 5760 by 3840, and I was uh, editing it on a, a Thunderbolt display that was 2560 by 1440, which is basically half the resolution. So if you do the numbers, uh, if you want to think about 4K or 5K displays, the Thunderbolt is in essence a 2.5K display, okay? Uh, 
So I just felt frustrated because I just felt like I wasn't getting all the benefit of my file. So uh, in recent weeks, I decided to go back to editing on a desktop and um, instead of hooking a laptop up to a Thunderbolt display, I uh, upgraded to the Apple iMac 5K display. So now uh, I'm editing on a display that's 5120 by 2880 uh, versus 5760 by 3840. So even though it's, you know, obviously the display is not exactly the full resolution of the file, but I'm, I'm much closer than I was with a Thunderbolt display. So the images on this display from the 5D Mark three are just remarkable. Uh, you really see, you really see a lot of pixels. I mean, you really see the detail. Uh, if you live near an Apple store, go in and ask them or show the difference between a Thunderbolt display and a 5K display, have them put up the same image, which, which I did this several times actually before I made the decision. And if you stand back, you know, four or five feet, uh, it doesn't look like much difference. But if you're sitting there editing and you're, you know, 18 inches away, uh, there is a difference. And you can see much more detail in the 5K display. Now, Apple just recently came out with the Apple iMac 4K display, which is a little less money. But uh, you can see that uh, it's now available to, um, you know, uh, to... Um, you know, not necessarily professional photographers, but photo enthusiasts or whatever. Now, do you need a 5K display for, you know, reading the web? No. Um, but if you're really um, a true photography enthusiast and you want to get the full advantage of, of editing your files at the highest resolution possible, uh, then I would recommend looking into um, a higher resolution screen than what you have. And maybe what you have is, is 5K now. I don't, I don't know. Uh, also, too, I brought up just for PC people, I brought up the Dell 4K and the Dell 5K display. Uh, just to show you the differences in the resolution there um, and what have you. So, you know, even if you're a PC user, because, uh, as you know, Microsoft doesn't make displays, but, you know, usually you end up with a Dell or a Samsung or something of that nature. So, uh, anyway, it's something to think about. Uh, you know, most of us probably never really thought about it. And, um, but now, you know, I can really see uh, my image in the detail and how, if it's really sharp, you know, I mean, I just have a, a lot more uh, editing uh, confidence in my editing uh, than, than before. So anyway, something to think about. Post-processing. Here's my philosophy. Um, Post-processing, my experience is with uh, people, uh, most of us are on Facebook, not all of us, you know, there's about 60% of MPEG members on Facebook, about 40% are not, but uh, I'm on Facebook, as you guys know, and I see a lot of pictures posted in various groups and what have you, and uh, it's very clear to me, and you guys, probably some of you agree, uh, very clear to me that a lot of people really don't know how to post-process an image. Um, some of these images that, that are put up, it's like, really? I mean, you know, I mean, there, there are all kinds of distractions in them and this and that. So what our goal for MPEG members is to be conscientious of posting the best image that you can post and be aware of some of the pitfalls. And, and one of the pitfalls is post-processing. So uh, I'm glad you're here because that means that you either know a lot and you're wanting to learn a little bit more, or you're here because you know a lot and you want to share it with other people, or you're here and you don't know too much, but you want to learn more. So that's, that's what we're all about. So I think post-processing is extremely critical, but I think it's the least known thing. I, I talk to people all the time out in the field and, uh, you know, I just, you know, just ask them questions, you know, what do you, do you use Lightroom, you know, things of this nature. And I've had a lot of people look at me like I just came from Mars. It's like, well, what's that? You know, oh, well, okay. Do you shoot raw or JPEG? What's raw? You know, I mean, and these are people that, you know, have big expensive camera bodies and long lenses and really don't seem to have a clue of, um, you know, uh, their files and editing their files and, and what have you. It's just really interesting. Just ask questions when you're out and about. And, you know, when you're in parks like Yellowstone, you know, you're in a group of 
bunch of people as you're standing there waiting for something to happen. You know, you get to talk and then you really, really learn a lot. The other thing that one part of my philosophy is you want to be an artist. Uh, to me, you're even though I've never, well, I shouldn't say I've never painted a picture. I painted a picture, um, I think it was, and I still have it. I think it was like fourth grade or fifth grade. I took an art class and um, I still have the picture. It's a picture of a clown, believe it or not. And, um, you know, I've always had this interest in uh art and photography and and I think I can appreciate a, a nice photograph or or, or whatever um, but to me as a photographer one of the things you want to think about being is an artist in other words you want to create an image uh, that's beautiful and uh, will cause people to react to it and part of that is being a storyteller and uh, like that image I showed you the bison on the hillside if you just pulled up in the car and took a picture of a bison, you know, that's fine. Uh, but that doesn't really tell the story. It's like, where is the bison? Where is it located? What kind of environment is it in? What's the weather like? Are you with me? So you can really see that by taking uh, the image of the bison in their place and what we call a sense of place, you have uh, more of a story. You have more of an image that tells the story. So uh, anybody who's a photographer, you, you guys all know that you need to be storytellers. And of course, my personal goal is to make beautiful images and what I call them pretty pictures. So, you know, if that means that if I add a little snow to it or add some rain to it or I add a reflection to it or um, I take out some distractions to make it pretty. My goal is to make a beautiful image. And um, so, you know, I want people to respond to my pictures on Facebook or wherever and they go, you know, I want them to say beautiful. You know, and to me, if you have an image and you put it on Facebook and 15 people kind of respond the same way, beautiful, you probably posted a pretty picture. So uh, that's something to be thinking about. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people. I mean, if you go to Yellowstone, and I'll just pick on Yellowstone because I, I live in this area now. But if you go to Yellowstone, every car has five cameras in it. I mean, there are people there. You, you'll see, you know, iPads. People are snapping pictures with iPads and and point and shoots and cell phones. I mean, it's it's crazy. Uh, and they post them on Facebook. And, of course, you know, they just post them just because. But as as true enthusiasts, you, you know, you want to compose your picture. You want to, again, you want to capture emotion or behavior. So there's more to creating an image than just snapping a picture. So uh, I think I'm not preaching. I'm probably preaching to choir to most of you, but it's something that if you haven't thought about, um, I thought I would share this with you. The other thing is cleaning up your images. This this really drives me nuts. And I'm guilty as missing stuff just like anybody else. But, you know, don't post a picture of a bison with a stick going through its face. I mean, that just doesn't help anybody. And there are very, very easy ways to remove these distractions that you'll never even know it was there. Um, I, Every day on Facebook, I just saw one this morning, a guy posted a picture of a wolf in Yellowstone, which unfortunately I wasn't there the day before, but they, I guess the two wolf packs were, were fighting and close to the road. But this guy posted a picture on Facebook of a beautiful picture of a wolf coming towards him. Uh, and you guys know about those orange snow poles, you know, or red snow poles you see. Well, there were like four snow poles in the picture of this beautiful wolf. And, and when I looked at that picture, those orange snow poles caught my attention before it did the wolf. It's like, uh, I mean, I don't get it. So, I mean, you can, you can take those things out uh, very easily. And, uh, and I'm going to, I'll show you how I do it. And even if you don't have Photoshop, uh, you know, there's photo, photo elements. Uh, there's, um, there are other programs out there. If you're a Mac user, there's, uh, thing called snap heal it's a program that uh, works i think as good as photoshop to removing some of the stuff like a content to wear fill so but look at your picture and always look around the edges of your picture there's you know see if there's a branch sticking out out of nowhere or uh, something of that nature you know try to to really look around the edges of your picture and eliminate all the distractions because you know your photo should have a subject and so you want to create 
create the image so that people, when they look at the picture, they're looking at the subject, you know, and, and admiring your picture and not looking at the distractions, you know, the Coke can in the foreground. Oh, you, you know, I mean, you, you, if you're on Facebook, you see all kinds of stuff. It's just unbelievable. So, and maybe they don't know how to remove them. That could very well be, but they need to join MPEG and we'll teach you how to do that. Right. Here's another thing that I think it's important is when you create a photograph, I tried to create emotive photography. And I did a slideshow on this one time, and it got a lot of positive feedback, especially from the people on Facebook. But, you know, you're telling a story, right? There's that old saying, a picture's worth a thousand words. And part of that telling that story is a sense of place. In other words, if you're in Yellowstone, like yesterday we were in, you know, I was in Yellowstone, I took a picture of an eagle in a hoarfrost tree. It was minus four degrees. And, and I'll show you that picture. And... I created the picture because I wanted to tell the story and I wanted to show you a sense of place. And when you look at that picture, what you think of is it's cold. Here's a, you know, a bird that's uh, trying to survive in winter in Yellowstone. You know, it's pretty much a silent solitude in winter when it comes to uh, Yellowstone. And uh, when you look at that image, uh, you, you just see all kinds of things. And so when you when you create a, a motive photo, you want the viewer to cry. You want sure you do. Sure you want them to cry or smile or laugh or go ah or say wow. You want them to uh, you know uh, uh, emotively emit a reaction because if somebody looks at your picture and just nothing happens, well then nothing happens, right? And it's not really uh, maybe a picture that you. Um, is your goal, you know, and you, you want to create a picture that makes people react. And, and when I post pictures on Facebook, uh, I love it when people say that made me cry. I mean, it sounds awful, but my goal has been achieved. You know, I, I want to, uh, and you know, I don't post everything I have, you know, some of the stuff is crap and I throw it away. Uh, so I try to capture emotions and behavior and I, and I try to create uh, an image where people really, really like. Okay, so think about that. Okay, uh, raw workflow. Everybody has their own thing, right? And oh, by the way, I'm going to give you guys this presentation. I'm going to create a handout and just send it through your uh, link. So, in other words, in your uh, in your box, uh, your uh, webinar box, you should be able to download the file right from that. And I'll do that here in a few minutes. Um, here's my raw workflow that I'm going to share with you. And this isn't rocket science. Uh, this is just what I have found works for me. And, and I'm going to edit photos, uh, in real time, so to speak. I'll just show you how I do it, but I'll explain what I'm doing along the way and see how it compares to what you're doing. And maybe you're doing exactly the same thing. Maybe you're doing four steps more. Maybe you're doing four steps less. I don't know. But the bottom line is when it comes to post-processing a raw image, there's a zillion different ways to do it. And you, anybody knows anything about Photoshop knows that you can do the same thing in Photoshop 16,000 different ways and achieve the same result. Uh, the first thing that I do is I make a virtual copy, and I'll talk about that when, when I actually show you some post-processing. Um, I then uh, uh, choose the white balance. Now, on my cameras, I keep the white balance at daytime. Uh, if you want to keep it at auto, auto white balance, that's fine. Um, but the beauty of raw is you're able to change the white balance once you get back to your, to your computer. So, I uh, I do the white balance. Um, then I denoise it if I need to. Uh, then I do the lens corrections, the chromatic aberration. I, I, I level it out if it needs to be leveled, etc. And then I do the camera calibration and maybe a lot of you don't even know what that is, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Then I crop the image and um, depends, but generally I crop wildlife images 8 by 10 or 11 by 14 for a subsequent print. Uh, or And then landscapes I pretty much keep at 13 by 19 or 12 by 18. Okay. Uh, then I do the basic Lightroom adjustments, you know, the exposure, this and that, whatever needs to be done. And I always use the histogram as my guide. And then I do uh, local uh, Lightroom adjustment brushes. I uh, use a radial filter or the graduated filter. You know, depends upon what I need to do, if I think I need to do it. Then at that point, I'll go to uh, Photoshop or use plugins. 
And then when I come back to Lightroom, I'll make any final adjustments, and then I sharpen it. And I just use, I don't sharpen the whole picture, I just sharpen the a part of the image that I want sharpened, use an adjustment brush, and then I export the file for Facebook or my website or uh, send it to print, you know, and print it out. So that's so that's my my workflow for raw images. So again, I'll send you this presentation, and then if you don't have a workflow, uh, you just you know because a lot of people say, well, I don't know what to do first. Well, here here you go. Here's a here's a good guideline, and these are basically if you notice my workflow, it kind of follows. You know, uh, Adobe has done a really nice job with Lightroom over the years, and one of the things they've done in, on the on the sliders that you're making your adjustments, they kind of put them in the order that they're recommending that you make the changes. So if you notice uh, when I do a, an image, um, uh, you know, the first three or four is one swipe down through the panel. Then I go back to the top and go do another swipe down the panel. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, I think it will once you, once you see it in action. Okay. Um, and then I hopefully we'll have some time and uh, we'll talk about how to turn your photos into paintings or adding other elements. And um, this is uh, something that I feel sets me apart from a lot of photographers. I rarely see anybody doing this. And um, uh, I've, uh, for the last few years, I've been working with the various programs here and um, except for Topaz Texture Effects, which is brand new. Um, and so I've been trying to find that uh, oil painting look or that painting look because my experience is, is that when people buy images off my website, they actually prefer a, a piece of art if in their minds, a piece of art or an oil painting or a painting versus an actual photograph. And I, as you guys know, I travel for a living. I'm in medical sales. I am in hotels and hospitals every week. And trust me, uh, I'm always looking on the walls at what these uh, facilities have on the walls for pictures in my room, in the hallways, a hospital, in the laboratory, uh, you know, uh, in the in the lobby, I'm always looking to see what did these people purchase to put on the walls. And I can tell you right now, over 90% of them are paintings of some sort, either, uh, you know, um, an abstract painting or something. I rarely, rarely have I seen over the years an actual photograph of something on the wall. It, it, it It's usually altered or, or manipulated, and it comes out, in my in my opinion, more of a painting. So it goes to show you that, um, you know, if you're interested in selling your work to local hospitals, you know, maybe flowers or whatever, you may want to look at texturizing it, you know, uh, or turning it into a painting or combination. Uh, that probably has a better likelihood of being sold than an actual photograph. But again, that's just my own personal experience, okay? Okay, and then the last slide, we're going to talk about... Um, you guys sharing your tips and techniques. So, you know, you're not here to hear me rattle on and, and just see what I do, but I want to see what you guys do. And um, so uh, hopefully uh, some people will, will help me out and uh, share some stuff with everybody else. So I'm going to go ahead and close out this presentation. And uh, I'm going to go over here to my box. And... Um, I'm going to choose a file and I'm going to send this presentation to you guys. Okay, uh, there you go. So if you look at your if you look at your webinar box uh, down under handouts, you should see a link or something like that. If you click on that link, I believe you can uh, download that and um, and then have your own copy. Uh, if somebody could just verify to me that that you're seeing what I'm trying to tell you to see. And uh, and it, and then it worked fine because the file was not big. So if somebody could just let me know um, if you're able to do that, okay? Because on my end, it, everything seems to be fine. Uh, the file is L, uh, LRCC Live MPEG dot PPTX. It's a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you know what? Since you guys, not everybody has PowerPoint. I might have to. Here, let me let me let me change this. Uh, to a PDF, and I think it probably would be a better deal. Okay, so let me do, let me find the file here, 
and um, here we go. All right, let's try this again. All right, so let's let's make it into a PDF. All right, choose file, PDF, upload. Okay, all right, there you go. Now, now try it. So you should have two files, one PowerPoint, one PDF. And if somebody could let me know if you got it, everybody got it, cool. Uh, as, let's see, uh, great, downloaded on my Mac, got it, excellent, isn't that kind of cool? Uh, you know, this webinar, you know, as you guys know, we've been doing webinars now, what, for two years? Is this the third year? I think two years. I don't know, time just flies. And uh, they're making this better and better and better, and I've just been really pleased with all the enhancements, improvements they've made. It's just really cool. So great. So there you go. So you got your own little copy, and you can play with it or do what you want with it or put it on a bulletin board and throw darts at it, whatever you want to do. Okay, so let's start out um, in Lightroom. And um, let's let's do this. Just in case anybody has any questions about uh, importing photos, as you guys probably know, Lightroom uh, did something that was really kind of stupid, uh, or Adobe did is that they created this import, uh, new import, what they thought everybody would like, and it turned out nobody liked it. And so they've gone back to their old import. And so basically, um, of course, if I had a card inserted, my card would come up. Um, but my point is, is I, I build smart previews of one-to-one. -one. So if you see my cursor over here to the right, upper right, see right there? I build previews one to one and you can Google uh, previews in Lightroom and see the differences because you have choices of minimal or standard, but I do one to one, which is basically a full resolution preview. Uh, I don't import suspected duplicates and um, and then I I save mine on a, an external Western digital hard drive. And so uh, mine is classified by date. Okay. And then I then I import them, and uh, this is a USB 3 hard drive. And loading images off of cards is like lightning fast nowadays. So, okay. So as far as importing goes, is I don't do anything terribly fancy. Okay, so let's let's talk about. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Let's pick on. Uh, let me tell you about this. This is that eagle picture I was telling you about. Um, let's do this. All right. This is the original image of the eagle. And uh, you can see he's, he's uh, he looks pretty cold. Uh, it's, uh, you can see the hoarfrost on the trees. Uh, the image has a little blue cast. Well, that's because it's cold, right? Uh, the, uh, and, I, and again, uh, I have my camera set on daytime uh, or daylight, I should say. But I always like warming up, up a little once I get them into Lightroom. But, um, you know, uh, there's there's a lot to be said for this image. So um, what I and, and you got you to remember, this guy was probably 200 yards away. So this is a 500 millimeter lens with a 1.4 extender with a crop body. So you're looking at probably 1,200 millimeters. He was way across the Lamar River. Um, and I was at, if you've been to Lamar, I was uh, in the pullout, and he's clear across the river. And this is, uh, you know, obviously, I'm, this is the original image. And uh, it's not, not a bad image in terms of, uh, you know, uh, but my goal was not just to um, – capture an image of just the eagle but I wanted his whole environment uh, look at the snow in the background and everything and uh, you know you kind of get a feel for, for what it's all about anyway so by uh, so I warmed it up a little bit to give it a little bit of a sunshine look because the sun was shining but um, you can actually you can actually um, of course over here uh, under basic you can Take the temperature down a little bit if you think that's a little bit too cool. And um, there you go. So I cropped it by 11 by 14. Uh, otherwise, it didn't change all that much. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention and that I do, if you go under your tools 
And let's see here. Um, Okay, your crop guide, your crop overlay. Um, see where it says thirds and golden ratio and golden spiral and all that kind of stuff. Um, I typically, I typically use the golden ratio, and uh, I think I think that's a little bit better than the regular rule of thirds. But when I was, so let's do this. So uh, when I was cropping him here. Say do tool overlays. So there's the thirds. Here's the golden ratio. The golden ratio changes things. It brings the lines in just a little bit closer. So the idea was I wanted him in the in the uh, intersection. So when I cropped it, as you can see, I got him here at this in this intersection right here. All right. So if I do this, I got him here, but I lose the tree. I wanted the branches on the left. I wanted the full branches of the hoarfrost. So I preferred to crop him on, on this side. All right, there you go. So um, if anybody knows about the rule of thirds, uh, I know the rules are made to be broken, but I think the rule of thirds is is something you should keep in mind more than not because – you know, a lot of people create photographs and they put their subject right in the middle. And I just think you're better off using the rule of thirds or the golden ratio. So, um, again, if you look at if you if you activate the crop tool and you go under tools and you go under um, guides, the golden ratio is here. And then you can do triangle or diagonal or thirds. Um, but golden ratio is kind of the one I kind of kind of adhere to. OK. Um, I just like it better. Um, there, we had a presentation in MPEG last year on um, rule of thirds or something that were included a lot of information about the rule of thirds. And I just think that uh, I think the golden ratio it just offers offers quite a bit. Now, the argument would be if you crop this too, too much, you know, if you didn't, because see a lot of people, here's what they would do. Um, here, let's just do this. Let's create a create a virtual copy. So I can just play with that one. Okay. Here's what a lot of people would do. They would do this. They would take the picture, right? And they would do this. And they go, look, and they would put this on Facebook and say, look, I got an eagle. Right? Exactly. But uh, that's not what you really want, right? You, I mean, that's nice. And, um, but basically you take away the whole sense of place, right? So if you go back and to the original crop, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to delete this actually. Yep, hold up here. Yep, actually that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to remove this copy, okay, and go back to the, go back to the original here. Here, I went up here. I got them all stacked here, guys. Oops. Come on. And where to go? Guess I got them stacked there. There we go. All right. There we go. So, uh, to me, I prefer this crop because uh, it gives it gives a sense of place, it gives the environment, and it's cold. Um, and then, you know, somebody may argue, well, gee, you know, you got him over here to the right. He's got some room to fly off if he needs to fly off. I mean, there's that argument that if you, if you crop it like this, yeah, I would never do that, right? But I really wanted that tree, so, and I wanted to stay within the guidelines. So something like that, it looks, looks pretty good, okay? So when it comes to cropping, but to me that just tells that tells the story. Okay. Okay, so let's go to um, let me get this thing out of the way here. So let's go to uh, something that uh, you guys probably already have seen, and uh, I'm going to this is the actually the, this is the original image uh, when we were in um, Yellowstone yesterday. Uh, and, and I'm going to sh tell you something I just discovered that is an error in this picture. See where it says Gardner River here, guys? Anybody who's been Yellowstone, that's not how you spell Gardner. There's an I here. So this, that sign is actually misspelled. 
So I, I don't know if they just know that or they just figured, well, what the hell, just leave it, leave it go. But it actually is misspelled. So it's G-A-R-D-N-E-R, -E and it's actually G-A-R-D-I-N-E-R. -E so anyway, just for your information. Anyway, this is the original image. Uh, these are some uh, bighorn sheep, and uh, they came off the mountain uh, to the right. And uh, as we were approaching the bridge here, uh, they came out behind the sign and stood here. And uh, I stepped out of the car, snapped a few pictures. I would have liked to have had this this mom here show her whole face, but they were leery of the car. And uh, before, uh, right after I snapped this, they both went up the path and went back up the mountainside. So this is the best I could get. Uh, but basically, when I looked at this picture, I, I saw a couple things. I like the, I like the the uh, even though they got the bridge in it, but that kind of tells the story, right? You got the Gardner River and. You know, you're coming into Yellowstone, and you're kind of this is kind of your welcoming party. Uh, the one thing that I that I took out of this was the this uh, pole. It looks like a metal pole here. Uh, so I took that out using the content aware fill um, uh, tool. So um, so all right, there's still the pole there because this is my my crop, and then this is the final image here. And see, I took the pole out. Okay. So, all right, all right. Now, what would you do, what would you add to this picture to make it even more interesting? Anybody have any ideas? And I haven't, I haven't done it yet, uh, but I'm gonna do it right now just to show you. What, what could we do to this picture to make it more uh, scenic or make it more uh, interesting? Anybody have any ideas? You can put it in the question box if you have an idea. It should be obvious, but but I'm just going to let you guys tell me what you know. If you had if you had the uh, uh, better situation for this picture, what would it be? Let's put it that way. There you go, Linda. You're right. Snow falling exactly because you got you got snow all over, right? Uh, exactly. So let's add some snow, right? All right. Now, if you're a purist at this point, you may want to close your eyes or go get yourself a Coke or something. But we're going to add some snow. And I haven't done this because I wanted to save this for you guys. Exactly. Good point, Linda. Yeah, snow falling. Uh, actually, snow was falling, um, you know, earlier in the day, but we got there when the snow had stopped. But uh, you're right. If you add a little snow here, uh, that's going to make uh, that's that's going to make it. Um, much, much more appealing. I, I agree with you. So I'm going to use a, a program called ACVIS, A-K-V-I-S, ACVIS Nature Art. And you can add rainbows, you can add snow, uh, you can add uh, a lot of things, uh, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you. Now, this is uh, a company called Acfis. That's A, A as in Apple, K as in Kevin, V as in Victor, I, S. It's acfis.com, and it's out of Russia. And I've got several other plugins, and this one I really, really like. I like their oil paint, too. But uh, if you don't know anything about Acfis, I found them in a book that I was reading like two or three years ago. I had no idea they existed. They're, they're not terribly well-known in the U.S. You don't hear a lot of people talking about them. But if, uh, if you want to if you want to think of Acfis, you kind of think of them as the topaz of Russia. You know, they, they, they create a lot of different plugins. And uh, in fact, uh, let me, here we go. Here's, here's our website. This is acfist.com. And you can see they have a ton of products, an airbrush, chameleon, the charcoal, uh, molded brush, and they got HDR factory. They got oil paint, pastel. They just got all kinds of stuff. So it's very much uh, a Topaz type of company. Uh, in fact, they have some stuff Topaz doesn't have. Anyway, so we're going to add some snow, falling snow. And the idea is you want to make it look realistic, right? And uh, so let's do that. So let's go under Acfis Nature Art. All right. And so here you go. So here's the image. And uh, I've got rain here. And rain is part of snow. 
Okay, you can see the preset here. I'm going to I'm going to take this this fill bucket and just click it on the picture, and it kind of chooses the whole picture. And there you go. There's some falling snow, just like that. One click. How cool is that? Now, doesn't that look natural, right? Tell me if tell me if you don't think it does. Tell me what you think. All right. So, yep, exactly. It's awesome. Now you can increase the density. So, you know, you can do this. All right. See how I'm adding snow. Okay, there you go. If you want a blizzard, there you go. Uh, but the idea is you want something just enough, right? Just enough. Something like that. Okay. And then you can change the length of the snowflakes. So, you know, you can go really crazy or just down to the very, very minimal. Again, increase the density a little bit and you can change the scale. All right. Say so you make bigger flakes or smaller flakes. All right. Isn't that cool. But the point is adding falling snow realistically. You would honestly, you would never know the difference. If I posted this picture with the snow, you would assume, and be honest with me, you would assume that that's the way the picture was, right? Okay, and then you can do dispersion or transparency, and then there's all kinds of things. You can add downpours, you know, uh, but of course rain wouldn't make any sense here. There's other effects. Here's water, lightning, clouds, rainbows, etc. Okay, but it's just that easy. To add a little falling snow and uh, there you go see yeah so let's see here let's change the scale here a little bit all right let's change the density and let's take the transparency down all right there you go that's it you click OK bingo there's your snow okay now in Photoshop uh, you have the ability always to dial that back. So he says here, it says up, up under edit, it says fade nature art. So you can have different blend modes here. And then, of course, if you want to take the snow down a little bit more, you can do that. See? Isn't that cool? Bingo. There you go. And to me, that just adds a totally different mood to the picture, don't you think, than if there was no snow falling? Very natural. Yep. Exactly. So we'll go ahead and quit Photoshop and we'll say save. Now, don't you think that would make maybe a kind of a cool Christmas card uh, picture? I think it's kind of neat. It's just too bad we didn't have the second mom here with her whole face. But I know it's okay. I mean, it's uh, it's still pretty cool. So there you go. So we've got we've added the falling snow for you guys, and that's that's it. So there's with now look here's without it and with it boom looks very natural there you go actfus nature art that simple dad snow okay the important thing is if you're going to add effects to your picture make sure they make it makes sense obviously and uh you know uh, somebody would say, well, gee, you know, I know it wasn't real because there wasn't uh, snow on the backs of the of the, of the bighorns, uh, backs of the animals. Well, maybe it just started snowing, right? You know, maybe it just started snowing five minutes before you snapped a picture. You know, you're not going to have snow accumulate on the, on the bighorns by then. But to me, that just makes all the difference in the world before, after. There you go. Bingo. Okay. So there's a nice little little tip of how to add an element and make the picture that much more interesting. Um, now, I posted this picture on Facebook just real quick, and I'll show you something here. And um, I posted on Facebook, and down here someplace, there we go. And it got shared 37 times, and it was liked by over 200 people, just as it was. I would bet you if I added snow to it and posted it, it would have even gotten a greater, uh, a greater response. Okay? And again, you see people's response. It's a beautiful picture, beautiful picture. That's what you want. 
Okay, you want to create images of people because I mean, what's I mean, what, I mean, as a photographer, right? I mean, it's other humans that are ones that are going to respond to your photography and, and make you feel like you've accomplished something, right? So, you want to create an image like that. So, cool. So, there you go. All right, so let's talk about let's do something else here. All right, and if anybody has any questions or you want to chime in and add something, um, you know, just say something here. All right, here's, uh, well, you know what, let's let's go back. Let's go back, let's go back, let's go back. Um, yeah, let's go back. Because I want to I want to show you something else here. As you can see, I spent a long time with this with this bull elk at the roadside, and um, uh, you know, I took a lot of pictures, right? And there was just a certain look that I was looking for, and I just was hoping to catch that particular image. So here, here's what I'm talking about. All right, so here he is. He's feeding along the road. Now I'm about 100 yards away. I'm down the road with a long lens and of course people are naturally driving up stopping right in front of my my lens right and uh, taking a picture and uh, you know that's a nice picture and that's a snapshot but the problem with this is I don't like the head pose and it looks like he's sleeping he's got his eyes closed so here I am taking subsequent um, 10 frames per second so here I got him eating all right, he's got his eyes open, he's eating. Well, that's pretty cool. That's behavior. And you always kind of, the thing about wildlife photography is a lot of people just get impatient and they, they want to get out of the car, they want to snap the picture, get back in the car and go. Well, sometimes you got to stay there and wait for them to do something. You can't go up to them and say, Mr. Elk, you know, could you please turn your head this way? I mean, it doesn't work that way. So sometimes you have to stay stationary and wait for them to do things. And sometimes they never do what you want them to do. Um, so, Okay, so that's pretty cool. I like that. And see, he's, he's chomping on this grass. All right. All right, now, now, you know, I wanted a side profile. So now, you know, he turns his head, right? So we just, just, just follow me here. So he turns his head. All right, he's looking. He's chomping on his, his grass. All right, now he starts turning his head back. See? All right, now he's back to looking like he's sleeping again. Now he's going down. All right, now what I like about it is, you know, that's a nice picture too. That's fine. But my point is, as we go through the sequence here, the one that I really liked was this one. So, you know, because that's about the best, you know, that's that's not bad. But see, he starts turning around. See, this is not a this is not a good picture here. You want you want that side profile. So that's as about a side as as he got is about right there all right okay so I got him with with uh, grass in his mouth which is behavior right and I got him a little bit now I would like it better if he had if he had turned completely looking this way but he didn't he was more interested in feeding now he had uh, three cow elk and another stag bull uh, sitting under the trees across the street uh, resting so he was pretty much by himself so uh, just for simplicity's sake uh, I, I thought this picture was was probably the better of that sequence that particular sequence the better of better of them all now there may be some others here that you like or that I like later but this is one that I, I wanted him to raise up so I could kind of see his face and see, you know, again, he's got some grass in his mouth, etc. He's a beautiful bull. Look at that. And I think he's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven by seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, maybe a six by six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, maybe six. Maybe a six by seven or something like that. But he's a that's a nice, nice, nice bull elk. Okay, so he's right along the road. All right. So, uh, but again, I'm I'm about a hundred yards away or so. So, okay. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, create a virtual copy. So I double click and I go to create virtual copy. Now what's a virtual copy? A virtual copy is just what it says. It's a virtual copy. You're not duplicating the file. You're creating a virtual copy. So it looks like the file has been duplicated, but you don't taking up any room on your hard drive. 
So in other words, my original is untouched. My original is the image before it. If you look down here in your in your uh, time frame, uh, your uh, film strip, you can see where there's a. This looks like the the corner's been uh, raised up, like you know, flipping the pages. That's a signal of a of a uh, of a um, virtual copy. So I'm going to work on the virtual copy because I'm going to turn this into an oil paint. And so then I'm going to do another virtual copy. Okay. But right now I'm going to make a virtual copy and do my editing. All right. So I'm going to go to develop, do my develop mode. And again, I'm going to follow my workflow. And of course it's in my head, so I don't have to look at my page. But the first thing to do is, of course, you can change your white balance. Now, remember, I have it on daylight. Now this is daylight. All right. So that's cool. Uh, if you want to make it, cloudy that means it just makes it warmer but to me that's too warm so i'm going to go ahead and just stick with daylight that's what i had originally in my camera okay under detail uh this is where you denoise it if need be now if you notice under uh i shot this at 250 iso there's not going to be any noise uh this is the 5d mark ii and the noise levels you know i can shoot up to you know, well over 800, probably 1250 to 1600 before I even worry about noise. So there's really no denoising here. You can see by default, uh, Lightroom adds a little sharpening. I always take that away. All right. Cause I want to sharpen it myself. So I'm not going to really denoise it because it really isn't noisy. Okay. Lens corrections. I'm under basic here and I'm going to enable the profile corrections. I'm going to say remove chromatic aberration. If anybody knows about chromatic aberration, that's where you have like purple fringing around the edges of things like windows. And maybe in this case, you might have purple fringing around his, his uh, antlers. Uh, but Lightroom has done a fantastic job uh, of, of creating a chromatic aberration tool that really, I haven't seen chromatic aberration for years uh, since they added this. So um, I always check that. Now, you notice when I check the profile, uh, my camera profile, it says none. All right. Why is that? Well, that's because I'm using an extender with this 500 millimeter lens. Now, uh, so I have to go in and, and find the profile that best fits what I'm using. So here I'm going to choose Canon. And I'm going to go now the 500 f4. Uh, the, this is the version two is in there, and this is the 500 f4 version two with the 1.4. So I'm going to choose that. That's the closest. That's not exactly the lens. I have the older version. I don't have version two. I have version one, if you will. But I'm going to go ahead and choose that because that's the closest that I come. And you can see the lens correction that was done there. Okay. I'm going to do that again just so you guys can see that. All right. So I'm going to just. Um, I'm going to choose uh, one here, then I'm going to choose another. All right, now watch here. So I go under Canon and go up here to, and again, you got to find the one that you like. And um, this is the uh, 500 with the 1.4. You, know, you can watch the difference, not much, okay, from the previous one. But still, the lens corrections are there. Um, so if you don't have uh, your lens in that profile, just pick something that comes the closest, all right? And in my case, it's the 500 two with the 1.4 now you probably noticed here that you've never seen this 1.4 2.0 thing before that's because that's brand new with the new uh, lightroom version 6.3 or uh 2. 2015.3 they just they just added those i've never seen those before until now so i think that's pretty cool okay okay so then then i'm going to go to camera calibration and you know, in your camera, you set your uh, style profiles. So, uh, you know, if you're an icon user, you have Vivid and all that kind of stuff, right? Well, in Adobe, Adobe has Adobe Standard. They have Adobe uh, Faithful. I mean, I'm sorry. Canon has Can a Camera Faithful, Landscape, Monochrome, Neutral, the things you can choose from. Well, my cameras are all set to Camera Standard. All right. And you see when I choose camera standard, it kind of darkens his face and his belly area. But I go to Adobe standard and that actually makes a more natural look. That's what he looked like. So in other words, uh, you can this is your camera calibration. So just because your camera was set to camera standard, that doesn't have to be that way. You can actually try any of these. You can do a camera monochrome. Say, you create a black and white, right? You can do whatever you want. Uh, 
I, to be at my, from my experience, I find the Adobe standard to probably the one that I choose 85 to 90 percent of the time. I think it does a better job of interpreting the file and giving me uh, the most, the truest uh, colors, if you will, and what what looks best. Okay. Um, but again, you can experiment, try all these different ones. Of course, you wouldn't use portrait because that's for portraits. But uh, I usually either use camera standard, Adobe standard, or if it's a landscape, I'll do camera landscape. The thing with landscapes, and we'll show you here in a few minutes, uh, it adds too much blues, uh, and greens, and reds. But pretty, pretty much the blues are the ones that get out of hand. So I tried to not use a landscape one if it's just it creates too much blue because I ended up have to take it take take it out. Okay, so here's Adobe Standard. So I've done my camera calibration. So now I'm going to go crop it. So I go back up to the box boxes and since this is a, a wildlife photo I'm going to crop it 11 by 14 you see I have different choices here and I put in I have my own uh, ones you can customize it 11 by 17 13 by 19 or some of the standards here uh, this is 11 by 14 so in other words if I were going to print this out or put it on my website for subsequent purchase by people if they're interested in this photo uh, then it would be cropped appropriately and it would the print would look nice all right now, uh, since he's looking to his right, I'm going to crop it so that, uh, again, remember the uh, ratio, golden ratio here? So I've got the cross lines here. So I'm going to bring this down and put him right at the cross lines, put his head and position him right at the cross lines. Okay. All right. All right. So there's 11 by 14 crop. All right. Pleasant photograph. Okay, so now I'm going to go to my basic adjustments, all right, and I'm going to look at my histogram here. Actually, my histogram looks pretty good. I'm exposed to the right. I got no clipping, right, so not, not too bad, but there's some things I want to change about this, just, just a hair, but not, not a whole bunch. Uh, the other thing, too, is when you shoot in, in – uh, you guys all know this, of course, but when you shoot in wintertime, uh, you know, especially like in your in Yellowstone, there's a lot of snow, and then you have your subject, right, in this case. Now, we've got some rocks there, of course, but, but basically you've got white, and then you've got your subject. Well, your camera is going to want to make that white a middle gray, right? So a lot of times if you shoot at zero – exposure compensation right in the winter time your pictures are dark and your sky your 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 uh, snow is gray and you're thinking what the heck um so when i'm in yellowstone in winter i'm characteristically uh shooting at plus one to maybe even plus one and one and a third one and two thirds and sometimes even plus two so if i have a dark now this animal is you know it's kind of a light brown you know it's not like a moose where you have that dark brown but if this were a moose uh you would probably have to shoot this uh to get some uh, detail on the moose you probably have to shoot that at one and two thirds maybe even two plus but remember you're it's winter time you got a lot of reflective light so even though you're shooting at plus two for instance um your ISO may be still be 100, and your shutter speeds may be quite adequate to handhold still uh, in winter. So it's a totally different ball game shooting in winter uh, than it is in the in the spring. Because in the spring, this background would be uh, brownish green, right? And it would be a totally your camera would look at it totally different, and try to interpret it totally different. So when you shoot winter make sure your snow's white so when you post a picture on facebook you know now granted when facebook when, you guys ever notice when you post a picture on facebook how the picture once it posts it sometimes doesn't look like it did in lightroom that's because if facebook compresses them and so uh you may have everything perfect in lightroom and then when you post on facebook the damn thing's dark and you're going man how'd that happen well, it's because of Lightroom. Lightroom will strip the color space. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Facebook will strip the color space. Uh, it, it'll take the, some of the exposure away. So you have to compensate for that. So if you post it and it doesn't look right, you have to take it off and then maybe increase the exposure. And then uh, when you put it on Facebook, the subsequent decrease will be, be adequate. So if you wonder why your pictures didn't look like the way they did, um, now that's why, because, you know, Facebook compresses them and, you know, they're not really a true representative of what you saw in Lightroom. So, 
you know, just to be just be aware of that. Okay, so what would I change about this picture? Well, maybe adding a little snow, but here's the problem. What's the problem with adding a little snow here, guys? I'll see if you guys can figure this out. Why wouldn't I add snow here? He's in a snowy background, right? But would snow, that's right, Chris, He's, it's sunny. There's no reason to have any, that's, that's exactly right. So adding snow would not seem, if anybody knew what they were doing and looking at the picture, they go, well, that don't make any sense. He's got a damn shadow because it's sunny out. Exactly. So adding snow doesn't work. Okay. Now, if the, if it's cloudy and he didn't have a shadow or very little shadow, you know, or, you know, very, probably very, very little or none, if it's overcast, well, then you could add snow and it would look really nice. But yeah, you're right. And so fortunately, you know, I had a little light on this guy uh, coming. The, the sun was up here and shining down. You can see his face here is in the, in the shade a little bit, but we'll, we'll fix that, try to fix that a little bit. Okay. But you're right. Yes. There's just cause there's sun. So the snow doesn't work. All right. So I got him cropped. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm not going to change a lot here because look at the histogram. It looks pretty darn good. I'm going to add a little contrast here and I'm going to take down the highlights just a hair. Now see when you take down the highlights, it makes the, notice how it makes the uh, snow uh, a little grayer, but then again, it brings out detail in the snow. See the detail in the snow. So you can kind of see the little bumps in the snow, whereas here you don't. So I'm going to bring down the highlights a little bit. I'm going to bring up the shadows and see if I can bring that side of his face a little lighter. See how it's bringing his face up a little lighter? But the problem is, see if you go too far, it darkens, it lightens the shadow. I don't want to do that because I like the shadow too. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of, kind of keep it the way it is, but I'm going to darken it to where the, the shadow stays dark, but we're just going to adjust his, his face. All right, the whites, blacks, the clarity. I'm going to add a little clarity and see what clarity does. See, it just just does what it says it does. It clears it up a little bit. All right, so add a little add a little clarity, but not a whole bunch. No vibrance, no saturation. I rarely ever use a saturation slider. Rarely, um, unless it's you know an oil painting or something. I really want to add some color to it, but I rarely add add saturation at all because usually what comes out of the camera, the raw file looks looks pretty good. Uh, but sometimes I do, but not very often. All right, so now I'm going to take an adjustment brush. And this is up here in the corner. You guys know, all know about enough about Lightroom to know. And you do an adjustment brush. So I'm going to, I'm going to work on his face here just a little bit. And there are two techniques here. I can increase the exposure. All right, so I've got the exposure increased about 0.29. And then I can paint in a little light here, right? And then I can go back here, and if I want to increase it, I can increase it. Give it a little bit more light here. See, you can go crazy and really burn him out. All right. So maybe, may I just want a little bit of light so I can see his eye. All right. Now, if you don't like that, you can just simply hit delete. Take another adjustment brush, and uh, we'll just lighten up the area around his eye. So I'm going to use the bracket key and just make a tiny brush here. All right, maybe just lighten this up around his eye and then increase this a little bit. All right, something like that. Maybe increase this a little bit. Just like that, okay. All right, how's that look? That looks a lot better, doesn't it? Okay. All right. Now, the other technique is, you don't like that? Okay, we'll delete it. And then we'll we'll do shadows. So like his his face is in shadows. So you can do shadows and see if that gives you a better result. So I'm just going to paint the adjustment brush here and bring out the shadows. See how's that look? All right. Personally, I think the exposure did a better job because I can see a little bit more noise. So I'm going to go ahead and use the exposure brush. And again, just, just kind of lighten this up a little bit so I can see his eyes. All right, maybe a little bit on his antlers there. Okay, and then maybe just increase this just a hair. All right, there you go. All right. All right, so, and now if you want to darken that shadow a little bit, then you can do that. So you take the exposure brush, take it down a little bit. 
to minus, all right, and kind of do this, all right, and kind of make his shadow a little darker. You want to bring that out a little bit more, all right, then you can take the exposure down, say, make it just a little bit darker, something like that, say, pretty cool. All right, let's make this bigger. Now, how do you know you're in the lines, right? Because sometimes people just, and I'm guilty of this, you know, you kind of kind of make these adjustments, and it's like, well, how do, how do I know I'm in the lines? Well, you can do a thing called overlay, because you don't want any, any, you know, here's a shadow here, and you want to darken this, right? Darken this. Here's his legs. Darken this. Etc. Okay. All right. So there's this little box down here that says show selected mask overlay. When I click on that, it shows you where I actually took the brush. So you can actually see where you're at, right? Now, let's just say I got crazy and I went over here and I didn't want that. Well, I can go over here to erase, hit erase, has comes up with a minus sign, and then I can erase that, right? There you go. And then if I got outside the lines here, so I can erase that, just so that I stay within the shadow. Okay. Then you can unselect this, and bingo. There you go. So I've, I've darkened the shadow a little bit. Uh, there's a little snow on the rock here, and this looks like actually, let's do this. It looks like maybe I got some on the rock yeah, just a little bit. So I'll do the erase here. Do that a little bit. There you go. All right. So there you go. So I like his shadow. Um, I like the fact he's got food in his mouth, etc. And then I think Bernie mentioned on the other one was about the vignettes. Um... Uh, why wouldn't you add the full shadow since he is impressive? Oh, I think I, I think I think I did that, Chris. I think um, you were thinking before he actually did the whole thing. But yeah, I did. I tried to do the whole shadow, right? But the shadow is not really the main thing of the picture. The main thing of the picture is you're showing him eating. He's in the snowy environment, etc. So, uh, but the shadow is cool. Um, there's some other pictures where I got all the antlers in the shadow, but. Um, Anyway, okay, so uh, we lighten him up here a little bit. We got him eating food, so that's kind of cool. Um, but I see some distracting elements. Uh, one is, I know this is a rock, but it actually looks like it's grown out of his belly. So um, basically what I do is I go to, light, I go to Photoshop, and um, I'm not a Photoshop guru. All you guys know that. Anybody that's known me long enough to know that, that I know enough about Photoshop to be dangerous, and that's that's about it. So, um, you know, occasionally I use layers for things, uh, but basically I use Photoshop for cloning and content-aware fill, and, um, you know, that's that's about it. I really don't do a lot in Photoshop. Okay, now Glenn Petranik, who's a coordinator for MPEG, you guys know Lynn, he's a Photoshop guru. So if I have any Photoshop questions, I certainly would ask Lynn, Glenn because he kind of knows what's going on. So anyway, all right, so mine defaults here to the, um, what we call the um, spot healing brush tool. Okay, and I'm going to increase the size here a little bit, but see, this is to me distracting. I just don't like this. So I'm going to just simply paint this and get that, get rid of that. Okay, now look around and see if you see anything else that's kind of distracting. You know, you've got the weeds in the background. Well, you know, that's part of his environment. It's, you know, you don't have any weed going through his face. You got the, you got the, uh, the weeds, you know, he's chewing on. That's fine. Um, I'll get rid of this. Maybe get rid of this. Okay. Um, do I see anything else distracting? Get rid of that. But yeah, that see that to me that looked like that looked like uh, grown out of his belly there. Um, but everything else I think looks pretty good. I don't mind the weeds in the background because that, again that's the environment. And um, but if he had weeds going through his antlers, if you will, I mean like here's one on top of his antler, if you will, you could always get rid of that. Boom, bingo, gone. 
This is this is an awesome tool. The Content Aware Phil said so I'm using Content Aware here, and I'm using the the Spot Healing Brush. It does a phenomenal job, really phenomenal job. So I'll clean him up here a little bit. Uh, see, he's got some stuff on his nose. Let's get rid of that. There you go. All right. I don't know if he had what that was. If that was snow or something, I don't know. Didn't like it. Took took care of it. Okay. So anything else? Let's see here. How about this? Let's get rid of these these weeds here in the foreground. Yeah. There you go. Bingo. All right. Anything else? We got a weed here going up to his leg. We'll get rid of that. Bingo. Gone. All right. Now, if you make an error and you go too far, so to speak, you can go up here and undo. So you can go back several steps, if you will, and pick up where, where you want to where you want to uh, leave off. Okay. Okay. So I'm clean that one up here a little bit. Not too bad. Now, um, Bernie mentioned about the vignette on I think on the last last image. Okay. So let's. Uh, let's kind of do this with that one, uh, do that with this one, but I got two different ways that, that I do that. Uh, here's the radial tool. If you notice up here, right beside your adjustment brush, you have this, what they call the radial tool. All right. And what you do is this basically, I use this primarily for creating, uh, uh, vignettes, if you will. Um, so in other words, I've got, I've got the tool here. Oops, excuse me. Let's get rid of this. All right. All right, and basically, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pull this out, pull this out like this, all right? Now, the problem is, is if you do this too much, it's not going to look right because of the snow. Um, so I'm not going to do, um, do an extreme one here, okay? But just to show you... Um, if you have, if you do your radial filter tool and you have it set to exposure, all right, we'll do exposure here. See, it says exposure minus 0.24. If you bring this over to the left, everything outside the circle gets dark, but the inside stays light, okay? All right, so, and the same thing if you want to do the reverse, you invert the mask. So when you do this, everything inside the circle stays dark and everything outside stays light, right? So I always have that unchecked because I use the exposure just to create a slight vignette, not a bunch, all right? Just just a little one. You can't do a lot with snow because then it ends up and the snow becomes black. You see, it doesn't look right. So just 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 a tiny bit maybe. All right, you say done. Now, the other tool that I like using for vignettes, if you will, is Color Effects Pro 4. And that's a, if you guys remember the old NIC uh, software programs that Google bought them and ran them in the ground, um, basically. Um, but I still have them. They still work with subsequent versions of uh, operating systems. So until they don't work, I, I still use them and love them. But there's a tool here that I use a lot. It's called Darken Light and Center. All right. And so basically, you take this little icon that says Place Center. So I click on that, and I'm going to put this where I want the light to be centered. So in other words, I'm going to put it right here on his face. Did you guys see that? All right. And then you have this option of your center luminosity. So you can increase the light in the center of the center of that dot. Say so you can increase it or decrease it or whatever. Then the border luminosity, this decreases or increases. So you can see so you can really decrease the border. Okay. But again, it makes the snow kind of kind of gray. Then you got the center size. All right, I usually keep the center size down. But what it amounts to is I'm able to take this little little placement and put this right on his face. Then I can concentrate the light on his face. See that? 
There you go. So we didn't do all that much, but that's just another tool to creating a vignette. Okay. And again, you can see the snow here is just to get a little bit of gray, but that's because we've got the vignette going here. So, and if you don't like that, of course, you can just add a little bit more exposure, increase the highlights, you, know, you can bring it back a little bit. All right. Okay. So let's see here if, we, if anybody's got any comments or whatever. Uh, why wouldn't you? Uh, why not use spot healing brush? And, okay. Good question, Dan. The spot healing brush. I hate it. In Lightroom, I, I think the thing's awful. Um, it's it's okay for um, um, it's okay for in my experience it's okay for like uh, camera spots you know dust spot sensor uh, on your sensor that kind of thing, but that damn thing is uh, they need to improve it and and a lot of guys and gals a lot of people on the Adobe forums have been increasing people. Um, I mean, have been uh, lobbying Adobe to actually put uh, content to wear um, their spot healing brush in, in Lightroom. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen because they want you to be dependent on Photoshop a little bit. So, but I agree with you. Uh, it'd be nice if you could use it, but I just don't think it works that well. So I prefer not to use it. Uh, also, too, being a, a Mac user, um, there's a uh, program called Snap Hill Pro, and uh, I'm just I'll, even though I know everybody's not a Mac user, but I'll go ahead and open up just to show you. Uh, this does a um, this does a phenomenal job of, of removing stuff, and I think it, in a lot of cases it does a better job than, than Adobe's Content Aware. Uh, but basically, this has a lot more uh, options. Uh, but basically what you do is if you want to get rid of something, let's just say you want to get rid of this. I don't know. Let's just say you want to get rid of this rock. I mean, I just pulled pull something out of the air. Um, you have a global or local or dynamic adjustment. You just say erase and uh, it gives you a little, you know, facts and hints and quotes and that kind of thing. But boom, it erases it. All right. But again, I wouldn't want, I want to do that. Now, if you want to go back, you just go back. And uh, you know, it's, it, you're, you can go back to normal. Uh, you have a nor you have a normal precision, a high or highest precision. The highest takes longer, but I have actually defaulted to Snap Hill Pro uh, when I just can't get it right with Adobe, and usually it does it right. It, it's really good. So, uh, but I just don't I don't care for the spotting and brush. But those of you that are that are uh, wondering what Dan's talking about, there's this uh, brush here. This is spot hand brush. You can either clone or heal, okay? And uh, I find it, uh, so what it does is they say you want to get rid of this rock, all right? What it does, it tries to find something close to match it and clone it in. So that's using clone. Here's heal. You can, you know, you can switch modes. Um, I just don't think it does a great job, and and it and it um, it's if, if if anything, it's one feature in Lightroom that I just don't I think needs improved, and a lot of people seem to feel the same way, you know. So yeah, so it depends upon what you're like you say used to, but I I usually go to Photoshop if I need to get rid of something, and and do it precisely. I usually go to Photoshop and use the spot healing brush. Okay. All right now. It's maybe uh, we're at 2:30. Wow, this thing's flying by. Let's talk about uh, turning your photos into paintings. And if you go back to that list that I had, there's a ton of programs uh, uh, that you can that you can go to. You got Topaz Simplify, Topaz Impression. Um, a lot of those, all of them do a great job. But uh, let's do uh, this for fun here. Let's just kind of go to um, Topaz Impression. So I go to edit in, I just bring it up. I don't go to Photoshop. I just use a Lightroom plugin. And of course this brings up, you know, an advertisement, if you will, up here. All right. So there's my picture and these are all the different presets. These are the features. So I go under painting. Now you can experiment. There's a zillion different things you can do here. Here's charcoal and pastel. Uh, I think that's kind of cool. I mean, look at the charcoal. Isn't that pretty? Uh, and again, you can adjust these anyway. You just click on them. Gives you your, there you go. 
So you can really create some really cool stuff. That's pretty pretty far out there, huh? Uh, there's smudge and there, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. But I used to go to painting. Now, when I work with these painting programs, um, I typically don't rely upon one particular one. I actually use a combination of two or more usually because I know what look I'm looking for and sometimes the one particular program doesn't do the best job just by itself. Um, I find Snap Art 4 uh, Alien Skin, I think, does a pretty good job as a single program. Um, but uh, a lot of these, I, I have a tendency to use a combination. So here are the paintings. Here's all the different, you know, you can see the different versions here. Here's Oil Painting 1. That's kind of cool. So it looks like a painting, doesn't it? Oil Painting 2, Oil Painting 3. Got a little bit more, uh, excuse me, it's got a little bit more, um, Here's color pencil, kind of interesting, okay. Here's photo painting one, all right. There's just, like I say, there's just a ton of stuff. So let's go back to painting here, and I'm going to pick one here, and I'll show you. So oil painting two, I kind of like, kind of like that one, all right, but I usually don't stick with that. So what I do is I kind of do kind of like a, um, a half a version, if you will. So I go down here where it says strength down here in the corner. All right. And then uh, I'm at a blend mode normal. And this is at 100%. And I usually take these things down to about 60 to 55 to 70%. So in other words, I get an... I get an oil, I get an oil painting texture look, but it still looks natural. If that makes any sense to you, okay? So, I, you know, I kind of like this way. See how it's altered the the snow, and you kind of have brush strokes here. You know, it still looks pretty natural. You can take it down to to fifty percent. All right. Now you can sit here and play all you want. Um, but you know, there's that looks pretty good. I kind of like that. Okay. All right. Again, you can say okay, and uh, you know, it goes it goes back to Lightroom. Okay. Now let's do a before and after here. All right, just so you guys can see the difference. So I'm going to label this one uh, yellow. Okay, so I can find it easily for the most part all right so here's 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 yellow so here's so there's the before all right there's the after before and after so you see it has a painting quality see now would somebody buy this one and print this out or would they buy something like that that has a little bit more of a painterly look and again you're not done uh, you can go to your develop module and uh, you can, um, uh, I, what I would do here is, um, let's see, let's close this. I would probably add a little contrast here. Same way, add a little contrast there. And again, I would take the exposure brush and add a little, add a little light where we were back here. And then I would maybe take, in the, take the exposure brush, go to sharpening kind of sharpen his eye a little bit, you know, just, just because I like that. Okay. All right. So again, oops, before and after. I personally, I think that's a better picture. Um, you can see that it's got a little bit more color to it and the, the texture, um, it looks like a painting. And where paintings come in handy is if you have an image that's uh, noisy and you've tried to take as much noise out of it as you can, um, you know, turn it into a painting because you don't see any noise in the painting. It just completely obliterates it. So if you have a nice landscape and it's got a lot of noise in it for whatever reason, or, and but you still like the picture, well, then turn it into a painting and then uh, you'll, you'll like it. So uh, this is Topaz Impression again. Isn't that pretty? What do you guys think about that versus the before and after?
So again, this is before, oops, sorry. Um, this is bef before and after. And this is the original. So look at the difference between that and the things we've done to it. Um, yep, Chris says eye peeling, exactly. It's, it's, it looks like a painting, does it not? Yeah, it really does. And uh, so I think Topaz Impression does a pretty good job. All right, so let's go, let's go back and then we'll make another virtual copy here. All right, and let's try, uh, let's do uh, Impresso Pro. This is by Jixi Picks. And uh, this is a company that makes a lot of software. You probably have heard of them. All right, and uh, you know, this looks complicated but uh, they have different presets down here. So they have things for like portraits and things for like landscapes and, and subjects. So you just simply click on them, all right? And you get all kinds of different stuff. I mean, some wild stuff. I mean, you name it, okay? So again, you can, you can do anything. Oh, that's kind of cool. So, and the layer opacity, you can take the layer opacity down. All right. And you can change the stroke size. Okay. You can do all kinds of stuff. And, and again, uh, you can apply to photo. And again, this goes back, back into to Lightroom. Bingo. And then remember I said you can fade it in Lightroom. So, um, oh shoot, I forgot to do that. Sorry about that, guys, because I didn't go to Lightroom. Anyway, uh, I don't think you can fade it here. No. So, uh, so there's another wild look picture, you know, I mean, it's kind of neat. Some people may really like that. Uh, you can, you can add a little, you, again, you can add a little contrast to it. But, you know, I mean, people buy abstract paintings for millions of dollars, and I can't, I can't look at it and tell hide their hair out of it, but at least you can tell you got an elk there. So, so that's, another, that's another option. Uh, personally, I like Topaz Impression a, a little bit better, so I don't use Jixi Picks as much as um, – all right, so let's go back. There's, so there's that one. There's that one. All right, let's go back and make another virtual copy here. And uh, we're going to go to Snap Art 4. This is kind of my favorite one, especially for landscapes. And this is by Alien Skin. And uh, I don't think they're going to update um, this anytime soon. I don't know if they're discontinuing the product. Um, all right, let's delete this. This is from a previous version. Okay, so they have over here, they have different selects. It's under oil paint. They have detailed, so I always like the detail. So you click on detail, and, and you get this note up here. All right, so there you go. There's You get this. It says the mask is empty. Draw the mask here on the image. You use mask. See the mask effect? You have new areas, and then you can create uh, you can color in a mask to bring back more of the original image all right that's what that's for if you will um, but you have different defaults over here you got your lighting vignettes close weave and I always do transparent I don't like to do any more than I have to when it comes to adding a lot of texture to it because I want it to be as natural as possible all right um, and then you can change uh, the photorealism. You can change it to 100%. Uh, that's the effect of detail. You can, you know, of course, you can adjust the saturation and stuff just like you could. So I'm going to go ahead and apply. And um, all right. Now, that, that doesn't look too bad. Um, Again, this is one of my favorite ones, especially for landscapes. But I can add a little contrast, take down a little highlights, increase the shadows a little bit maybe, and then sharpen this up a little bit. Now, you have to understand, anybody that's been a painter knows that um, 
that paintings are not meant to be detailed, right? In other words, when you when you when you have a painting that pretty that takes out detail. So that's the difference between an actual photograph and when somebody paints something. Usually, if you look at a painting, there isn't a lot of detail. So here's a case where you actually are taking out detail a little bit, but not enough to know not to not know what it is. So there you go. So there's there's Snap Art Four, and you can see you're able to do this in a very. So there's there's uh, there's there's Topaz. And there's Jixie Pix, and there's uh, Snap Art 4, and there's there's the original original. So you can see, you can just have all kinds of fun with these things. But see, here's the original. To me, I think the eye, it's a little bit more appealing when it's just a little bit. I'm going to bring down the, bring down the, the, the temperature on this one just a little bit. But I think it's more appealing, and it's something that somebody's more apt to print and put on their wall. I personally would print something like this and put it on the wall versus an actual photograph because I want more of a painting in, in, in my personal opinion. I just think it would look better on the wall. Okay, so those are different programs and uh, we'll do one more here. Um, we'll do Actvis. Actvis oil paint is, is pretty decent. I, I kind of like it as well. Um, but again, I usually use a combination of things. So, um, but I'm going to go ahead and and let's go ahead and just make another virtual copy of this. You can see the, the advantage of virtual copies. So I've got basically a copy of each one that I've done. So if I like a particular one, I can keep it. All right, so Actvis will go to will go to Photoshop because it's a it's not a Lightroom plugin thing. It's a Photoshop plugin. This is called Actvis Oil Paint. And then we'll also do to pass simplify from there too. Um, if you've never been exposed to any of these, I would highly recommend you can download trial versions and uh, try them out yourself. I have all of these. I've had Topaz Simplify for years. Topaz Impression, I bought that immediately because that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Topaz Texture Effects, that's brand new. I have it, but I really haven't worked with it, but that looks really phenomenal. Uh, Aquas Oil Paint, Nature Art, Ac I've been an Aquas user or customer for probably four or five years. Uh, Alien Skin, uh, that's one of my favorite. Probably my least one that I like is the Gypsy uh, Picks Impresso Pro. All right, so we're back to Photoshop and we'll do Actvis and you see I have Airbrush, Draw here, Nature Art, Neon, Oil Paint, Pastel Sketch. They got all kinds of stuff, but we're going to go to Oil Paint. And with the Acvis here, let's let's do this fit image inside the thing. With Acvis, there's this little test box, so you can see the effect within the box. So if I pick up my see the simplicity here, if I increase that, there's less detail each time. Okay, see that? So there's a three, there's a two. Okay, there's a one. You can see how it. it um, so I usually stay with simplicity one or two. All right, now here's a before and after. So if you click on after, this shows you the effect over the whole picture, okay? So here's your here's your before, here's your after, okay? Now this program has what they call a history brush right here. And then you can brush away the effect in certain areas, okay? So if you double click on this, you can see that you have the different hardness levels and strength levels and aspect and what have you, okay? So this history brush is basically you're painting out. So you can paint out the effects if you want to paint out the effect in this face a little bit, okay? And again, if you want to increase the strength, you can increase the strength. In other words, the effect it takes out even more, see? Okay? So uh, I kind of I kind of like the history brush on this one. Um, I think this does a pretty good job uh, for the most part. You have a ton of presets here. Look at this. So it shows you the effect here in the box. You have intense oil, ripples, pastel. Uh, the, the, the thing is, what I want you guys to get out of this is that you have, if you have all the time in the world, uh, which I don't, but if you have all the time in the world, you're able to sit there and create masterpieces and uh, cr create wow pictures. Uh, you just, you got all kinds of possibilities here. It's amazing. And um, 
you know, these programs are not that expensive. I mean, you're, you're talking 59 bucks, 69 bucks, you know, 49 bucks, that kind of thing. So you're not talking about hundreds of dollars. Okay. Now here's Actvis. So I'm going to go ahead and quit this. Say I like that. Now, again, we're in Photoshop and uh, I'm able to actually roll this back a little bit. So I can go up here and fade oil paint. And again, I can fade it down so again, down to like maybe 65%. Okay. Or maybe I don't like that and I want to bring it up more. Maybe, you know, I can do different blend modes. Maybe bring it up to 80. All right. So you can do whatever you want. And then if you quit and save. All right. So there's, all right. So there's, there's the before. Oops. Sorry about that. There's the one. Now there's Acvis. So we'll make Acvis. Hold up here. Let's make Acvis blue. And then we'll just do it before. All right. So we got we got blue here. There's the original. There's Acvis. There's there's Jixi Picks. There's Topaz Impression. There's the original. So if we do if we do the um, let's do this. Let's do uh, we got the original here, and we'll do the, the blue comparison. We'll do an XY comparison. There, so here's the original on the left, and uh, the Acvis on the right. So you can see it looks like the same photo, but there's just a little less detail, and it gives you that that painterly look, if you will. Kind of neat, huh? How many? Uh, let's do a little survey here. How many have played with these particular programs? Oops, sorry about that. How many of the how many of you guys have played with these programs um, in the past? How many knew about Actvis? I would venture to say most of you have never heard of Actvis. So, uh, yep. Yeah. Well, Tom Tom says nope. Well, you know, if you like, if you want to be creative and again, be the artist inside of you and, and do different, something different than just a regular old photograph, uh, to me, you know, being able to be creative and, and, and do different things makes, makes a whole, whole lot of difference. I mean, you'll, you'll see if you start creating paintings out of, um, uh, you know, some of your photos, you'll, you'll start seeing different reactions from people because uh, they like that. It's it's it has that artsy fartsy look to it, if you want to call it that, as some people would say. OK. Anybody got any questions? Let's see here. Uh, OK. Terry says she has Acvis. I think Terry knew about Acvis, just Nick, the filters and Photoshop. So hopefully I've given you guys uh, some added things to look at. Um, you know, as somebody says, anytime they talk to Mark, it seems like he's always causing me to spend money. But, uh, look, if you're, uh, a photography enthusiast and you should be, if you're part of MPEG, uh, you're going to be interested in, in, um, making yourself stand out from the next person. And, and let's face it, uh, that's what it's all about. You've got to be unique and different. And uh, these these four or five programs will give you plenty to, to fool with. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, Barb says she's heard of Acvis through me and Topaz and Rex got Topaz and Nick. John says I'll check them out. And uh, are they saved as TIFF files? That's correct. Yep, they come back from Photoshop as a TIFF file. That's correct. And Terry says it's called a Christmas list by Mark Perry. That's exactly right. So I, I know the two hours have flown by. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have a microphone? And you want to jump in with something that uh, or some tips or techniques that you have? I'd be more than happy to, to do that for you. Um, I'm in no hurry. So just to give you guys, uh, ho hopefully you've learned something. Um, again, the idea here was not to be exhaustively uh, in a teaching mode, but more or less to expose you to some of the ideas that I have about photography and the things that I think uh, has been successful for me and um, and uh, and programs to give yourself a different. Uh, it, the, the important thing is when it comes to post process in Lightroom is develop a uh, 
develop a style, but also develop a routine. You know, treat your images, for the most part, treat them with the same routine each time, and there'll be a consistency in the look of them. Uh, you know, uh, create, a, create a workflow list and have it, and I used, to, I used to do this, I used to tape it up on my computer so I could, you know, look at it and remind myself of certain things. But for the most part, uh, you know, uh, if you do it, I don't do it every day because I don't have the opportunity to do it every day, but I, I do do it, you know, every week. Um, I, I've got this workflow down in my head that I can whip through and, you know, and adjust an image pretty, pretty fast. Um, I know when people do group shoots, you know, I always give, we give people like two weeks to uh, post their pictures for group shoots and people will go, well, you know, two weeks. I mean, I need more time than that. Well, no, well, no, not really. I mean, I mean, I can, I can, and anybody should be able to take three or four pictures and uh, in a matter of just minutes, you know, make the adjustments you need and, and post them in the, in the results, you know, the group shoot results. So anyway, okay. Anything else? Let's see. John says, can you show the, uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. John wants to know if I can show the, the Photoshop content aware spot healing. Tech. Um, yeah, sure. Let's find something. I'll tell you what, let's, let's find something else here. These are pictures from, uh, 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 let's see here. Here we go here. This is a really good one. All right. So here we, let's see, here we go. Yeah, here we go. All right. Any pretty, all right, but the problem is we got all kinds of crap in the way. Now, I I know some of you may say, well, that's his environment. I understand that. But here's what happens when you clean clean the damn thing up. See, he actually, he's right, you know, it, it, this has turned into, this has got an oil paint texture, and I've cleaned up uh, the area around him. Because the focus is he's framed by the weeds, if you or the reeds. Because if you notice, there's some water here. He's right by this creek. This is going towards Lamar Valley, and uh, this was handheld using my my uh, 500 with the 1.4, leaning on the car hood. I, there's just no time to set up a tripod to get this guy. Okay, so uh, uh, fortunately, he did he did kind of come over here uh, to where he was his I wanted his face clear because trust me if you get some of these reads through his eyeball that gets a little bit more complicated so if anything you know you don't want him um, you know you don't want him uh, with his face obscured so I was fortunate enough this coyote any beautiful his nice winter coat I was fortunate enough to to get him. So this is the oil paint version, and again, it's got a little bit more color to it. Um, and I, again, I can hold on one second here, and um, I can take down the temperature a little bit. All right, there you go. But see the oil paint texture. You can see if you zoom in, you see the oil paint texture. Uh, I, he's a cutie, and I I love the picture, and I would put that on my wall in a heartbeat. All right. So, um, but yeah, let's go back to John's question about the technique for the, so let's go back to the original picture and I'm going to create a virtual copy just because. All right. And I'm not going to do the full adjustments, but I'm bringing the exposure up here a little bit, but you can see, uh, this, we got, we got ourselves a little coyote here with a bunch of, bunch of crap around him. Um, one of the things that I did like was the fact that he's got that archy, archy, uh, that reed that kind of arches over his head. I thought that was kind of neat. And so I contemplated keeping that in there or not. Uh, but I, I eventually did take it out because I basically wanted to get, get him all cleared out. Um, so that the focus was on him and not, not the reed going across his head or, or something of that nature. So that's just a personal, personal preference on my end. Um, you know, so, Okay, so let's, um, all right, so John was asking about, all right, so you go over here to the left, you have spot healing brush, and then you have the healing brush tool. I stay with the hot spot healing brush. It's a little bit more uh, fine. Uh, sometimes I use a content aware move tool occasionally, but the spot healing brush is what I would use in, in this case. All right, now here's a, here's a, here's a tip on technique.
Now we want to get these off of him, but we want it to blend in with his fur so it doesn't look like it's something that's been removed, right? So what I have found through experience, and this is that arching reed I kind of I kind of like, but look look see it looks like he's got reeds growing out of his head. That drives me nuts. So you really got to clean this image up. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful image. You got you got the nice subject. He's sharp and all that kind of jazz. It's in flat light, obviously, because it's cloudy that day. But it shows Yellowstone. It shows the coyote hunting for food in the snow. He's by the river. Get he just got a drink. So uh, but you got these reeds. Uh, so my experience is if you have a reed like this, you you kind of want to see if you notice up see notice up here where I'm adjusting the size, say, so in other words, if you leave it big like this and you just go like this, you know, you don't get good, good blending. Okay. So I'm going to undo that. Okay. So what you do is you take your brush and you narrow it down and I do strain by strain. Okay. Cause I want it to blend in with this coat. All right, so this gets a little tricky up here. All right, and again, if you need to repeat something, you can repeat it. All right. All right, there you go. So we've gotten rid of those reeds. And then you say, well, maybe I better get rid of this. So again, you want to keep your brush small and get through his, through his paw here, through his... his his leg, all right, because his feet are in the snow, and you can get rid of this one. Again, do single strokes. Take your time and you read by read. We got this wand that's the arch. See, so you can just kind of go around like this, get rid of that. See, it's it's amazing. I mean, they've, Adobe's done a real nice job. Get rid of this one that's grown out of his ear. You know, so you can really clean this up. It doesn't take, see, here's one grown out of his ear again. So I'll get rid of this, these guys here. See, same thing here. So when I'm, when I'm photographing a subject like this, the reeds don't bother me because I know I can remove them. It's just that I don't want them through his eyes because if you get them through his eyes, that's a little bit more difficult to get a good blending out of it. See, still you got things look like they're growing out of his back here. Same, like here's one here. See, clean this baby up. Too often people don't clean up their images. Either they don't know how or don't even think about it. But you really want to clean that up. So that even looks better than it did. Maybe if you want to leave these here because that looks more natural, that's fine. But again, you got I, the problem is I have I, I have with this stuff. See, it's grown out of his head. So you got to be really careful here. And, you know... And usually the, the brush does a pretty good job, you know, of getting rid of that stuff. There we go. All right. All right. And if you don't like it, just undo it and go back, go back to the original. You know, you can start over again. But you see, I'm getting better here. Now, this was a little trickier. See how this kind of fills in the corner of his, his furry ear and stuff? So I had to use the clone tool. So the clone tool is this looks like a rubber stamp. All right. So what I did is I took the clone tool and, and I used my option key to sample where I want to clone from. And then I had to go in here very carefully and get rid of that. Now, I'm not doing it precisely because I know time guys don't sit here and but see I had to do the clone tool on that one to really clean him up all right so uh, John is that what you're looking for so again spot healing brush is what I start out with and then it's content to wear here selected you can do proximity match uh, you can go back and forth but for the most part content to wear is your is your better deal especially for wildlife but you can see we've cleaned him up considerably here um, get rid of this one here by his jaw. See, he just looks a lot better. And again, I had to use a little bit of, you know, you just do it bit by bit. But clean that baby up. 
you know, do not post a picture like this on Facebook with all these reeds growing out of the guy's head. Now, again, I'm not doing this as good as I did it before, but you can see how we've cleaned him up considerably. And then when you turn him into a painting, it just takes away any kind of, if you got, you know, some uneven areas or whatever, that's all taken away by, by turning into painting. So this needs a little bit more work with his ear here. But for the most part, we've cleaned him up pretty good. But I, I got rid of all those, if you noticed. So I'm going to go ahead and just not save this. But let's go back to the to the one that I was showing you here. And whoops, oh, I got one. See, there's one in stock, and I hadn't even got working on that one. I kind of like that one. Isn't that kind of cool? He was there hunting. Um, but yeah, so this is where you know I was able to get him finally get things separated, and again where he's um, you know where he's 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 out in the snow, kind of out in the open, but it still looks natural. All right. And, you know, you got some stuff po poking out of the snow here. Now, if you want to clone some of this stuff and put it right here to give it a little bit more uniformity, fine. But for the most part, uh, I kind of like that. The other thing, too, is when you clone these branches, make sure you're not cloning a branch. It looks like it has nowhere to go. Right? See, this one's grown out of the ground from here right beside this branch. But you don't want branches that have nowhere to go. So you got you to think about that, too. Okay? Isn't it pretty? I just lo I love coyotes in winter. They're just they're just the winter coat are so so beautiful. So yeah, it's because see he was he was over here. You can see he's walking away here. He's turning around. He's got some snow on his nose. I mean I've got tons of pictures I haven't even fooled with yet. So okay, John, did that answer your question? Here's here's talk about here's a here's I didn't do any oil painting of this one. This is actually a scene um, from. Uh, this is if you ever any of you guys have been to Silvergate. Uh, this is the the Grizzly Lodge right inside Silvergate, and it's got the 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 walk bridge here. And this had just snowed the day before, so I was able to get that out. I took out a couple distracting elements, but for the most part, it's pretty much what it is. I didn't replace the sky; that was the sky and stuff. But that's that'd be a nice Christmas card picture too, I guess. Okay, anybody have any questions? Let's see here, John. It's if I answer your questions, sir. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, he is beautiful. Yeah, I just, I love coyotes, especially all the winter coats, you know, in Yellowstone, the bison and every, the fox and all that. They're all look, they're all look gorgeous in their winter coats. All right, guys. Well, it's 3.05. Anybody got any questions or things you want to add? Um. Gosh, I went fast. Um, I'd be more than happy to do one of these again. And again, if anybody wants some one-on-one -on -one help, uh, as you know, we've been offering that for months. Uh, last, well, actually a couple of years since we've been able to do the webinars. Uh, I know I've had one or two requests from uh, from members, and that's about it. But more than happy to help you out any way I can. Um, and doing it online, even though I'm in Bozeman, Montana, you can be in Timbuktu and I can still help you. So it doesn't really make any difference where, where we're at. So, all right, babe. All right. Let's see here. Uh, thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I did record this so you guys can always look at it later, but I think the handout will really help you. And, you know, experiment with some of this stuff and uh, post the pictures on the MPEG site and Facebook. Do both. Because, again, not everybody's on Facebook. And show us some of your creativity and some of the cool things you've done. I mean, uh, to me, if you're like me, sometimes you get bored with regular photos. You, like, you kind of like to do stuff to them. Add snow, add rain, you know, whatever. Um, you know, you could see you couldn't really add snow. You know, you could probably add snow to this one. This is my desktop. Uh, but you got this blue sky, so that's not good, you know. So, but you could add snow to any of these, right? Here's here's one where he's got a little snow on his nose. I didn't take that off. I left it on there. But you can see it's sunny here. He's got little little shadows. And uh, this is the barn that's down the road from me, about uh, two or three miles. Uh, I love this barn, so I'm going to photograph it again when I don't have the cloud bank here and I got more snow in the mountains and I got snow completely on the barn. That's kind of pretty. This would be a great oil paint. Uh, I haven't done anything with it, but it'd be a great oil paint subject. All right, guys. Well, listen, I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for hanging in there. It's two hours has just gone by like 
like lightning. So, but hang in there. And uh, like I say, just be creative and do fun stuff. And uh, the folks that are coming to um, the winter in Yellowstone group shoot, I'll see you guys uh, in less than 90 days. And i um, thinking about having a spring in Yellowstone group shoot. So stay tuned for that. See if I can work that out because spring is a great time as well. But winter is really special. So the folks that are going to make the effort to get here in winter, you're going to have an unbelievable time. Trust me. It's going to be great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, you're welcome, Bernie. Oh, by the way, Bernie Wolf is a new member. And uh, I don't know if Kelly's still on here or not. Uh, let me see here. I don't see Kelly was on here, but she's gone. Kelly's a new member that was referred by Mark Barthel. So, um, anyway, uh, thanks everybody and, uh, take care and, um, I'll post some pictures of this Thanksgiving snow that's coming. So it should be, should be kind of interesting, but we, we, I got a, a text message of a winter storm watch already for our area. So it says three to six in the valleys, which is uncommon. You usually don't get much snow in the valleys. And it says to a foot of snow in the mountains. So it should be absolutely gorgeous by Friday and Saturday. So it's always gorgeous, but I mean, it, I love snow. So, well, listen, guys, take care and uh, we'll be in touch. You're welcome, guys. Good night. See ya.